All right. Welcome, everybody, to Fitter and Faster TV. Looks like we've got a bunch of people already logged in. We're going to wait for a second to let a few more join in here. I think we're supposed to kick off in a minute or two. Looks like we've got a bunch who have just joined. Welcome, welcome. Okay. Give everybody another 30 seconds or so, and then we'll get going on this. At this stage of the game, I feel like a game show host. I've been hosting these live events now for about five, six weeks. So appreciate you guys all joining us again. My name is Brett Hawke. We have a special guest with us today and very excited to have him. I am a two-time Olympic swimmer. I am a three-time Olympic coach. I was also the head coach at the university, uh, at Auburn University for uh, 10 years. So um, I, uh, I've watched a lot of great 500 freestyles in my time, and um, we have one of the best in the history of this sport with us today. So uh, I'll introduce him as people are clicking in here. Looks like we've got a good number joined in. Um, today we have one of the fastest swimmers in history in the 500. His name is Clark Smith. He is a six foot nine Olympic gold medalist from the University of Texas. So everybody, welcome Clark to the program today. He's going to click in here, I believe. There we go. There you are. Thanks for the introduction. Hey, man. How are you? Good. You? Good. Now, just looking at your best times here, tell me if I'm correct. Uh, 200 freestyle, 133.3. Uh, 500 free, 408.4. That's fast, man. Uh, 200 fly, short course yards, 140.4, and then the 1650 freestyle, 1422. That is quick as well. Do you have any plans of ever doing another 1650 in your life? Uh, not at the moment. I'm mostly focusing on middle distance, so 500,000, 400, 800 would be the goal. Yeah, well, cool. Well, listen, I'm really excited about this one. Um, you know, you're one of the fastest swimmers in history. Who actually broke your record? In the 500 or the mile? In the 500. I think Zane initially broke it. It's been tossed around quite a bit now. It's so most of the guys are hovering around 408 to 406, right in between that range that are winning NCAAs. Wow. Who's got who's got the record now? I think Kieran Smith. Florida guys hold, hold the records, I think, from what I know. Okay, wow. Well, there's been a lot of improvement in the last, you know. One that would be... There's been a lot of improvement in the last 10 years in the event. There seems to be a lot of depth. What do you think some of the things that have attributed to um, just everybody getting faster in the 500? Seeing someone else do it. I mean, it's yeah. kind of like um, the three, a few years ago, Townley went 130, and now you see a bunch of guys breaking it. Um, when you see other people do it, it makes it seem more reasonable to do. Yeah. Um, so the depth will increase. I mean, if you see more people, it's going to be a, a snowball effect. Yeah, um, I think uh, a lot of people in the NCAA gravitate towards you know shorter events, but um, I think I mean slowly and surely the 500 and the longer events are going to gain a little bit more traction. They're becoming a little bit more exciting, and usually they're kind of like the events people dread when the meet comes around. But you know, certain guys can change that. Yeah. So you grew up in Colorado. Who are your coaches in Colorado? I swam for I think my mom when I first moved there. And then Todd Schmitz was my first age group coach. And then Nick Frazier Smith was coaching me through high school. Nice. Now you, uh, why did you end up choosing Texas in the end? Uh, for me, it was fairly um, easy decision. You know, my parents swam there and I had contacts with Eddie before I even was being recruited. I went to those Longhorn swim camps from when I was nine to 14, 15. Um, I liked the pool. I mean, the campus felt like home when Austin was somewhere I'd frequent pretty often. So I, I didn't really have a huge list of schools I wanted to go through. I kind of had a, you know, a goal of going to you know Texas. And then if they didn't want me, I'd look at other, other schools. So it was a little different for me than for most other people. Did you take any recruiting trips to any other schools? I did. I went to the University of Michigan. I think they'd won the year I went on the recruiting trip there. So Mike Bottom was the head coach there. And I liked him. He was a pretty good guy. And uh, the guys were really nice on the team. I met Connor Yeager there. He was a really nice guy too. Yeah. 
Good dude. Yeah. Well, Con has done some work with Fitter and Fast, and I know you've done a lot of uh, clinics with Fitter and Fast. You do an outstanding job, and um, I'm sure some of the people watching today have probably been to one of your clinics. So, um, uh, welcome everybody. Now, listen, we're going to get into the 500 here. You put together a great slideshow for us, so I really want to get into it and start to ask you some questions. Um, I'm like anybody else out there probably, I don't know as much as you do. You're you're an expert in this one for me. So I can probably teach you a thing or two about swimming a 50 free maybe, but um, we're all going to learn some things today in the 500. So appreciate you putting this presentation together. We'll start it up and um, we'll have a look at it. We'll get it, we'll get it going here. So, so yes, we are breaking down the 500 freestyle today. Let's have a look. First slide, okay. Talk us through um, these talking points here, Clark. So the 500 is one of those weird races where it's kind of a middle ground. You'll have, you'll have guys come up from the hundreds and two hundreds to swim it, and then you'll have guys come down from the mile. And what that's going to do is it really affect the race strategy, and you'll see a lot of people going out with easy speed, uh, more 200 guys, and they'll try to hold on. And then in the mile, um, the milers will come down, swim with more, I guess, you know, smoothness in the front half of the race and kind of, you know, build it throughout. So there's no one way to do it and it's just kind of chaos as far as like race strategy goes. You kind of have to be your own man and kind of figure out what's going to work best for you and not kind of focus so much on what everyone else is doing. So we'll kind of go through, you know, race strategies later and just, I guess, kind of pinpoint what the focus areas would be best for, you know, a swimmer in high school and the best ways to improve in that event. Yeah. Now, in high school, were you, what were you? Were you uh, a lower end or were you a higher end trainer, swimmer, racer? So as far as like a trainer, I was lower end. I was mostly focusing on the hunter fly, tuner fly, tuner free. Um, so the 500 was just kind of an afterthought for me. I just kind of did it to do it. But I still kind of trained um, fairly well for, you know, middle distance freestyle when I did, you know, longer aerobic sets. But um what you do in high school doesn't necessarily affect what's going to happen to you in college. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but I was definitely shorter end. So going into kind of junior, senior year of high school, how many workouts a week were you doing and what was the volume of the workouts? Yeah. So in high school, during my club season, I was probably doing between you know, 5,500 and 7,000 yards in an afternoon workout. And that would be you know Monday through Friday. Saturday would be something similar. Sometimes a lactate set on Saturday. And then Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning, it'd be hour to hour and a half, you know, maybe four to four to 500 if I averaged out the yardage. Yeah. So you're doing probably around nine workouts a week at that stage? Yeah, nine workouts a week, but it wasn't heavy, heavy yardage like I see um, some club swimmers do. Like I see, I know guys who come from programs that do like eight to 9,000 yards for two hour workouts. So I never, I never did that much. I don't think it's necessary, but there's still a good quality, you know, base there, I think. Yeah. Now you're six foot nine. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, quarter inch shy. Wow. Now are you, uh, why aren't you a fifty freestyler? Because you've got the ideal height for for that. How did you end up swimming distance? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I thought I was a sprinter going into college, but I did a few workouts with a guy named Michael McBroom, and he was the American record holder in the eight hundred at the time. I was training with him, and I'd moved up from middle distance to distance in workouts. Um, I didn't really know I had any um, business being in the, the longer events, and I kind of discovered it. We do something called an Eddie Reese invite, so we'll do off distances. And Chris Kubik, the assistant coach at the time, when I was an underclassman, suggested I do a time 2000, and I laughed at him. But I did it anyway to kind of humor him, and I, I did okay. And um, I negative split the race, and I figure I probably should be in the longer events. We already have so many butterflyers. Even though that's my event, I probably should do what's best for the team. So I kind of inched my way towards the longer races. Wow. So you you really didn't embrace the 500 until college, really? Not so much. No, I didn't really see myself in that event, which is kind of weird. Things change as you get a little older. And I mean, you do what's best for the team and not necessarily yourself when you get to college. Yeah. Oh, wow. So going in freshman year into Texas, who were some of the upperclassmen in those events that you had to train with? So uh, Michael McBroom was the big one. Uh, he had just finished when I got there. Mm -hmm. and he was probably one of the best trainers, I think, in the sport at the time. He was 743 in a long course meter 800. Wow. And I just tried my best to stay with him in workouts. I mean, it was really hard. I wasn't ready for that. I didn't come from as much base as he did. 
but I just tried to hang on and eventually it gets easier and you, you adapt to it. But um, I'm glad I didn't do training like that in high school. I think it yeah. kind of helped the longevity of my career, at least in the longer events. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. So basically what you're saying here is that you can find success coming from, you know, being a shortest distance, you know, 200 type swimmer and then, and success as a, as more of a miler as well and kind of find that middle ground in the 500 then, right? Yeah, of course. Um, and when I was in school, Townley Haas, he was a 200, 500 guy and he'd won the 500 and I was a miler 500 guy and I'd won the five against double A's and went back and forth. So yeah. it comes from both ends of the spectrum. There's no way one, one way to do it. Okay, great. All right, let's have a look at the next slide here. I'm going to move our faces for us. So just this kind of just rehashes like what we just talked about. So easy speed. Talk to us about that. What does that mean to you? Uh, to me, it's just being able to go up fast with little effort. And the way you do that, I think, is mostly with good technique and great distance per stroke, and they kind of work off each other. Um, if you're spinning your wheels the whole race, it's going to be tough. You don't want to start grinding from the very beginning. So uh, this is something my parents talked to me about when I was little, and they told me the older I get, the more easy speed you'll have. And I, I didn't really know what that meant, but I kind of got it as I got bigger and stronger. I could go up close, closer to my best times with you know, less effort. Um, and that just comes from training and, again, technique. Yeah. Um, middle distance swimmers will have an easier time, I think, with easy speed. Um, distance swimmers will probably have to work on you know, a little bit more strength and I know patience in the beginning of the race. Now, are you the type of distance swimmer or middle distance swimmer, whatever you want to say about yourself? Do you run your legs or do you hold off on your legs? I hold off on my legs. Um, I like to take the race out as fast as I can without kicking as hard, much, as, hard as I you know, need to. Um, I, again, I don't think I'm a pure miler, but I did the mile, so I swim the race in a very different way than I think most 1650 guys would. Was there a different mindset anytime you got up on the block when you were swimming a, a 500 as opposed to a mile? Did you used to think differently? A little bit. Uh, I I would kick more with my legs, six beat kick for a 500 and maybe a four or two beat kick for a mile. So there's more focus on the legs the shorter the events get, the longer they get, you know, uh, lay off and start using your arms a little bit more. But you don't need to have a blasting kick for the first, you know, 100, 200 of that race, I don't think. Yeah. Now, in training at Texas, do you do a lot of kicking and do you do a lot of pulling, or what do you say, what do you think you, you work most on? So I swim in the distance group at Texas. Um, I do more pulling, lots more pulling. Um, Jesse Visayo owns a company where he sells these. Keeps you from kicking and you do it without a pull buoy. And we probably do, you know, 800 to 1500 yard sets with that, you know, every other workout. Um, kicking is pretty short. We do maybe eight to 1200 kick, you know, on a daily basis as far as workouts go. So, so when you're pulling, unfortunately, more pull to kick. The shorter the distance gets, you know, middle. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, you're good. Sorry, I think there's just a little lag in the in the feed right now. It's all right. But uh, in terms of pulling, you wear you wear the band that you were talking about. Do you wear a buoy and paddles or not? No, no, that's cheating. That's at least we'll give people crap for it. But I think mostly it just helps you work on your body position. And if you can go fast with only using your arms, it'll be more efficient. Um, being able to go fast without that heavy kick, I think, will help you finish that last 50 a little easier. Yeah, okay, interesting. All right, great. Let's go to the next slide here. Have a look. Cool. So, let me move our heads a little bit here, see what we can do. Uh, wrong way, Brett. That way. Okay. So technique. Why is technique important in the 500? The better your technique, the easier the race is. The faster you go, it works, you know, both ways. There's no downside to having, you know, a better stroke. Um, I think, I mean, working on distance per stroke should be the goal, taking the least amount as possible, while maintaining the best speed you can. But the drills that I do um, tend to help, I think, the most for this event. Um, I do one where it's a combination of a fingertip drag and a, and a catch up or so you'll keep your elbow high, drag your fingers on the top of the water that forces you to make a straight line across and have a really relaxed recovery up front. And then you wait for that other hand to enter the water and it slows down your stroke and it makes your recovery really nice and relaxed. I do it with a lot of clinics and it makes the kid strokes really pretty and nice. So that one's probably my favorite of the three. 
Um, I do a fist freestyle, so that will prevent you from pulling straight down under the water like a 50 freestyler would. So keep that elbow high when you pull, and that'll definitely help make the pull easier and a little bit more efficient. And then the last one is shark drill. So before you enter the water, you'll relax that hand out a few inches above, hold it for three seconds, and then enter, and that'll just help with a longer recovery and entry. You look like you got some uh, like hyper flexible elbows there, man. Somewhat. Oh, Flexibility yeah. will definitely help technique as well. That's not something I added in, but stretching, if you feel like you're stiff in your shoulders and your wrists, that's something that'll definitely help, at least I think, in the freestyle events. Hey, I was going to ask you that. I mean, obviously your technique is important. Um, how how often do you would you say that you do uh, drilling or do you think about your technique? Is that something you, you do every workout? I don't do drilling as often as I used to in high school, but as far as thinking about technique, that's something that's, you know, every day. I, I'll try to pick something out. Um, I'm still swimming right now, so what I think about I'm working on at the moment is just my breakout, keeping that hand in nice and tight. We take that first stroke, but I'm always focusing on hand entry. If you get sloppy and you kind of let go of it, you know, your hands can wave from side to side and things can fall out of a line if you practice with, you know, bad habits. Yeah. Now, um, does Eddie have one way of teaching freestyle? Does, does he like to stick to kind of a high elbow or is it dependent on the person? I think you're breaking up. I can't hear. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, there's a high pitch squeaking. Um, Eddie teaches about his, I think he's one drill he really likes. He likes six kick roll. And the reason he likes that is just for, you know, really good rotation with the shoulders. Three strokes, six kicks, three strokes, six kicks. And you're spending – time on each side, kind of over-exaggerating the shoulder movement, really working on rotating from the shoulders and the hips and not just swimming flat on your stomach. Yeah, okay, interesting. All right, let's have a look at what else. Okay, so there are the drills. All right, great. Now, do you do drills at the start of practice or at the end, or where do you put them in? I generally do them at the end of workouts. Um, but, I mean, towards the end of workout, I think – when you're fatigued and tired is where you can make the biggest differences in your stroke. If you do it during warm up, it's kind of easier to feel good and have good technique because, you know, it's the beginning and you're not really worn down. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's go to the next slide here. What are we looking at now? All right. Talk us through this. All right. So obviously you need a pretty decent aerobic base to get through a 500, but, um, you don't need to overdo it. You don't need to train like a miler to be good at a 500. It's still a middle distance event. So it could be anywhere from, you know, five to 7,000 yard workouts in a two hour session. And there still should be some implementation of some you know speed work. Um, I generally like to do fifties or hundreds pace. Um, but a good test set to see like where your 500 pace should be at would be doing something along the lines of three 100s. And you'll hold what you feel like should be a good pace and pick an interval where you'll get about, five to eight seconds rest on the set. So for example, I had, if you wanted to go 450, you would do three 100s on 105 holding between 50, 7, 58. And towards the second and third 100, you're gonna to start to replicate the pain of a 500. And then it'll start kind of getting, you, I guess, you know, introduced to that kind of pace and that feel and the stroke count and what everything should feel like when it comes together. is the uh, what is the toughest interval you've ever done hundreds on and what, what kind of pace were you holding so the toughest intervals i think would be i've done a set where i've done 100 on a minute 100 on 50 500 on 50 three rounds but i've never repeated hundreds on 50. um i've done i think 1600 on 55 mile pace and then into a 50 all out like a broken mile but that's about it as far as hundreds go. Wow. What's the fastest 100 and 200 you've ever pushed in practice? Fastest 200 I've pushed is probably, uh, probably around 137 or so, and then fastest 100 about 45. Oh. Wow. That's awesome. Okay. Good. That's good stuff. Now, there's different um, kind of trains of thought out there. A lot of people use kind of more of the urban check color system and I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with that and, and I talked to you earlier today and you said that at Texas you don't really use the color system based on heart rates and training zones and things like that. Um, what 
what is it at, at, at Texas that you do use or how does Eddie coach you? What kind of what kind of coach is Eddie? Because he has a lot of success. Um, well, he has a lot of success in everything, but especially in, in your events, like what is it that makes him so good? So I'm familiar with the color system. I think it's like white, red, purple, something along the lines where the color correlates with the heartbeats and the effort. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think he generally gives like a percentage. So he goes a 100s on so and so interval, hold 95 percent, and we kind of get familiar with what that pace feels like. But a lot of the times, you know, the team's really deep at Texas, so it tends to be more guys racing, setting the pace on their own. And a lot of times they do also hold something while they're going a lot faster and they laugh. So I think it really comes, the effort really comes from the swimmers and not so much from Eddie. Um, he'll tell us when he wants to back off and make it clear he wants the practice to be a recovery, but he's a bit different. He'll write the workout on the spot, he'll tell us what to go, and then the team really decides how hard they want to go. So it's a different dynamic than I was used to in this school. So it's almost like he presents you with a workout and then collectively you decide how challenging you're going to make it because you're all super competitive guys, right? Exactly. I, he's, no, he's learned by now that like, I can't really make someone want to try hard. The best way to make someone want to do it is make them find it within themselves. And there are a lot of guys who are competitive um, when you push off. Even in warm-up, I mean, there have been days where we start go hundreds on 120 and you guys holding 53s, and that's the slowest they'll go for the whole workout. Wow. But if um, guys are going too fast, he'll slow them down. doesn't happen often, but if someone's going slow, then he'll tell them to pick up the pace. So it's a little bit different than a structured workout where you hold this pace. Okay. All right. Stay within the guideline. All right. Let's get back into this, then. We'll keep going here. Uh so where am I going to go? I've got to change our heads down here. All right. So cool. tell us about this, uh, these training sets. So the training set, this is just like an average aerobic set, like an upper middle distance group or distance group would do it at Texas. Um, the goal of the set would be essentially hold the times on the 50s that you're doing. So if you want to you know, hold 27s on those 850s, 650s, 450s, 250s, you bring that into the 800. So keep the pace consistent, but you'll get recovery on those 50s, and it's just a constant pace versus with most distance swimmers and middle, upper middle distance guys, I notice they'll start a set off slow and then descend and try to save up. This set will kind of prevent you from doing that. You want to keep it the same all the way across. It's probably around the 3,000 yard set. I didn't up in my head, but that's something I've done a few times, and the intervals can be changed. Um, it's just, the effort is relatively hard. I'd say 170, 180 beats per minute if I were to put it on that uh, spreadsheet that you were talking about. But that's something I remember doing a lot. And then the beat to clock set is something I really like that replicates pace as well. I noticed when I want, want to do like 500 free work, I want a little rest as possible because it replicates what it feels like to actually be in the race. It's not comfortable. If you get 20, 30 seconds rest and you're doing all this pace, you're not really replicating how you're going to feel in the race. You're just replicating the speed itself. Yeah. Has there been a time in a 500 where you thought to yourself, I've gone out too hard or I've gone out too slow here? Do you have those moments? I have in long course meter 400. The 500 is short course, so you still have time to recover on those turns. I've gotten pretty worn out, but the great thing about short course is you kind of reset off every wall. Um, I never really regret taking the too hard, even if you die, because you relearn where your limits are. I always regret saving up. And if you lose the race, you're like, I wish we could do that again. And I don't really like having that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Have you ever lost count in a 500? Uh, in workouts, for sure, yeah. I've always had three counters in races, so though. I'd, I'd give some grief if I ever did this count for me. Yeah. Now, in a 53, when I'm swimming, I've got about 20 seconds to think. You've got about, you know, just over four minutes. Is there a, you know, what are you thinking during that time? Are you completely uh, focused on pace? Are you completely focused on technique? Are you, are you thinking about your competitors? You know, like, where's your head during those four minutes? That's a good question. I, I did realize the longer the race, the more time you have to think. And for some people, I think you can psych yourself out if you're looking at you know, whatever, whatever else is doing. Um, I think it's good to try to focus and 
what's going on. Last time I used to count one to twenty. And as you can, maybe you turn your brain off. That's a skill that takes some time to learn, but you can kind of shut down mentally and let your body do the work it's trying to do. It's, it makes it easier when you're physically and mentally. You don't seem to hurt as much at the end of the race. You haven't been focusing on everything else you've been doing. Yeah, okay. Well, let's get back to this slide show here. What's next? So, uh, talk to us about this one. So, this is a set I've been doing since, gosh, since my freshman year. Yeah. Um, it's a 200, 200, and 250s. Um, we do it on one ten pace, but it can be changed. And essentially, you're trying to replicate your overall 500 pace. So obviously, that you're not going to go your first split on that first 200. But when you add up all the time together at the end, it should be relatively close to your goal time. It's those middle 200s, I think, should feel pretty close to what the middle, you know, two, three, 100, 500 will feel like. So I'm all about trying to replicate the feel of a race and not pace itself yeah is this kind of your race strategy too do you break up the 500 like this in, in a race or how do you actually break up it mentally i count 120 so i, I don't break it up in my head that's not something i realized i did maybe a year or so ago i just went straight and try to do my best to kind of increase the effort every 50 and try to make it as consistent as i can do you like to be in the front? Do you like to lead the pack, or are you just always, like yeah. yeah. Clean water always feels good. I mean, even if you're not the fastest person in the heat, it feels good to be out front with the pack. Um, I was never, you know, I dropped it in my teenage when it was good as my longer events, but I still like to go out with the guys just more on that way. Yeah, okay. That's interesting. I like that. That looks like a tough set. Now, now you do that three rounds of that, right? Yeah, it's three rounds. The first round is moderately hard. The second round is is about, you know, I would say 98%, and then the last round is the fastest you can go. Wow. And you'd like to keep it consistent as far as split-wise, so if you hold, you know, 150 and then try to hold 55s or 54s in those hundreds, and then 26, 28 on those 50s, so just straight across, try to be as consistent as possible. Okay, now I think we have a short video here of this set. Um, I'd like to try and show it if we can. We'll see how we go here. Cool. Let's have a look. For the music. <laughs> yeah, I think if I dominated Townley in a 500 in practice, I'd make a video of it too. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, I think Swim Swim would come almost you know, every few months my senior year, but we do a set like that once every month oh, and okay. just kind of gauge where we're at. Is a, do you beat him every time or does he get you sometimes? Um, I don't think I've ever lost that set, but uh, I, I've done it more than anyone on the team, so it's not really a fair comparison. No, I have heard there are rumors that you're one of the most incredible trainers uh, anyone has ever met. Um, you, do you pride yourself in your training? Um, like work, ethic, work ethic wise, or just like time? Uh, I don't really think myself as a really hard worker. Really? I try to do what I need to do, and um, I guess try to hit the times I want to do. But I'm not really obsessed with you know claiming I'm tough. I don't really think I am. I don't think I suffer as much as most people do in practice. No, but there is there is talk that you have capabilities beyond what other people have. Like you have a you have a capacity, let's say, of, of being able to handle a lot of work. I think uh, being a little bit taller helps. You take a little less strokes, a little less worn down. Yeah. 
But um, I've been at the program longer than anyone else. I was probably about, about two years. So I'm a little more used to it than anyone else. I think we're still a few more slides, so let's have a look here. What else we got? Uh, let's move to the next one. That's the video. Let's go to the next one. So yeah, this is something that I talked to you about adding a, a few hours ago because I know that you know obviously turns and underwaters and breathing patterns are a huge part of the race. You've got 20 laps, so um, you know you've got streamlines off every wall. You've got turns. You've, you've got to figure out when to take your breath. So talk to us about those things for you. So as far as underwater, you know, we and Townley had this debate with Eddie, and we kind of came to the conclusion that underwater, though they have potential to make you faster, will eventually slow you down towards the end of the race. You know, taking four or five kicks or even more off every wall, just multiply that by 19, and you're going to be pretty dead by the time the last 15 hundred come around. So I would err on the side of taking no more towards one to two kicks, you know, it doesn't need to be a week done. And the 200s and below, but I think the longer the race, the more you need to kind of pace yourself and swim a little bit more. Yeah. And then as far as, you know, working on your turns, it's always important that your turns matter if it's a 50 or a mile, stay tight, come in out of the turn fast. And as far as breath control goes, I would say if you can, if you have a very smooth stroke, breathe every other stroke, um, if your breath is sloppy when you come to your left or your right, it would be a better idea to breathe every three, but it's very individualized. And I think and a lot of people have controversial opinions on breath control. I'll probably have said, you know, a few people by saying this, but I don't think it's necessary to do, you know, breathe every three or breathe every five. You're swimming such a long race. In a 50, yeah, I'll do breath the whole way. Yeah. So are you thinking of a breathing pattern in practice at all, or are you just thinking, I need air? What are you, what are you thinking? That's pretty much the of, you know, turns out of the green patterns. Don't be obsessed about it. Just focus on more of the swimming race versus turning it. Yeah. Now, do you hold your breath when your face is down and then let it out the last minute and breathe? Or how, how, what are you doing with the air once it's in? That's a good question. I come in, I usually try to bury my head going into the wall. Um, I'll slowly breathe out as I come in and start to flip. And then as I push off, I'll make sure I fill without half my breath in and breathe out. As soon as I come up, so I'm not taking a huge gap. Yeah, huge gap. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Uh, what else can I talk? Oh, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, younger swimmers are caught in kind of circle swimming because their their lanes are full. Um, what are some of the things you work on to help your your turns so that you're not swimming in circles? That's a good point, and that, that's something I had trouble with, and it it adds up in a longer race. And I'll tell you. Do a 500 and you're actually doing 500 yards. So, really just focusing on the black line, and that's probably better than focusing on who's going next to you. Just swim your own race and swim down the middle. And when you hit the wall, make sure your feet are planted somewhere in the middle of that black line. Because the circle swimming comes from the push up itself, not so much from the swimming. So, make sure you're not pushing off into the lane mode when you're coming straight off the wall. It can help to kind of lean back when you're on the wall, kind of shooting in one direction, kind of going straight off. I think that's about, uh, I think that's all the slides we have here. Um, mm -hmm. What else did, did we not touch on in the 500 that you think is important, Clark? I think you know, taking a risk as far as race strategy goes is a good idea. Uh, breaking out of your comfort zone and doing something different is something that anyone should be able to. If you have a specific way of doing something, you've been doing it for 10 years and you never really kind of, you know, step out of your comfort zone, you're never really, really going to know how good you've been doing I never regretted it taking my hours too fast, even if it wasn't the best strategy for me. So I would say that, you know, changing up what you're doing, the rhythm and your routine, can definitely you know, open yourself to improvement. Um, I always like to swim up front and take risks, and sometimes it didn't pay off, sometimes it does. Um, it's just a risk. Yeah. All right, listen, we're going to open up the chat now. We want you to ask some serious questions, so please. Uh, if you've got something that you really want to ask Clark, um, ask it in the chat now. Um, please do not spam. You know, let's leave it to the serious questions, and we can ask, we can answer some serious questions here. So, let's have a look at the chat. All right, I'll open it up again. So, shout out to Pippin Pigeon, or oh, Piper. Sorry, Piper. Who else we got here? Hope Souther, uh, Avery McDowell, Jesse Brown. Taylor Smith, 
All right, Clark, if you see a question there that um, you want to answer, feel free. I don't see what's popping up for me. Click on the chat itself. Uh, right, there we go. There we go. Uh, yeah, there is a high pitch audio. Um, it keeps loading. Why don't you pick one out for me? Uh, buffering for me. I didn't know. Uh, I'm sorry about the ringing. I didn't know there was any ringing. I'm not sure what that is. Um. So the best way to get past the anxiety before distance is race. That one, that one I can relate to. I used to get pretty nervous at the longer events, especially when I was in nature summer. I think I only did two miles, one long course and a short course, and I was in high school at the pool, so. I would just relax knowing that you can have room to screw something up and you'll be okay because the race is 15 plus minutes long. Kind of always comforted me. Whereas I would get really nervous for a 50 because I knew I, everything has to be dead on or I'm going to mess up my race. That always comforted me in a very long race. So anxiety has no place in the distance event just because it doesn't matter if you make one mistake. Yes. Let's see. Um, I'm seeing a lot of how do you build your endurance. Yeah. Um, the best way to build endurance is, like I said, with an aerobic base, you know, hitting between, you know, 5,000 plus yards, a workout at minimum for a 500 would be enough to kind of get you ready and, you know, get you in the groove to do you know something pretty good. The last 100, 200 yards of that race, it's a brutal event, even though it is short course, it still takes you know, a lot of aerobic ability. So making sure that you're, you know, communicating with your coach and coming into your meets and your big taper, um, um, championships. I would say that you're not over resting. Um, make sure you're not resting a month for a race that you need to be swimming for five minutes. Um, whereas the shorter events, you can rest a little bit more. So it's communication with your coach will definitely help you build that aerobic ability. Let's see. I see one. She goes, I don't know what I am. I don't know if I'm a sprinter or a distance swimmer. I'm really good. I am her, but I'm not a very good freestyler by itself. My coach thinks I'm a distance swimmer, but I really struggle with the distance practices. Any advice? I can agree to that. I was always told I was a distance swimmer, but I always uh, denied it. Um, it's still really good to do the events, even if they're not your best, because again, they'll benefit you in the long run, even if you don't do them. Um, I swam with a lot of guys who were really good 500 swimmers. I know Jack Conger was the national high school record holder in the 500. He didn't swim in college, but it helped him in the 200 butterfly. Um, I think he won NCAAs and broke the American record in that event. So making sure that, you know, stick with events and being well-rounded um, is definitely something you should do, you know, throughout your high school years. And then your college coaches will definitely pick you out and start, you know, specializing you in events. So staying well-rounded as a high schooler or middle schooler is definitely something that's, you know, important to do. Yeah, clock. I saw a question there. How do you uh, deal with pre-race nerves? I mean, you, you swam at the Olympics. Um, how, how do you deal with nerves? I try, tend not to think about anything before I get up on the blocks. Um, if you're getting really nervous, you got to stop looking at what's going on around you. Um, if you're looking at other people, if you're looking at the crowds, um, it's not going to help. So just having your own routine and distracting yourself is something that can really help. But what about you? What would you do to generally get rid of nerves? I, I think I would listen to music or I just put in earplugs before my race and just kind of zone out. Yeah, I think that was really good advice that you gave. Is stop worrying about the external. And I, I used to go more internal of like, okay, what's my breathing doing? I'd focus on my breathing. I would try and if I, if I could notice tension in my hands, I would kind of relax my muscles. So I, I'd really just try and work on relaxation and, and the, as soon as you go external, all those things start to heighten. You know, your heart rate comes up. You start to get a little bit more tense. You may even get a little scatter, scattered and jittery. Um, and so when I noticed that in myself, then I would just bring it back internally and focus on the breathing again. That's pretty good advice. Yeah, just not focusing on what's going on and keeping to yourself is probably the best way to stay calm before a race, regardless yeah. of the event. Now, what are you doing? Uh, what's the pro group in Texas doing right now in, in quarantine? Is there anything you're doing to stay fit? So a couple of us are swimming at an alumni pool. I'm in a 20-yard pool right now, uh, but I feel lucky because I know a lot of you know national team swimmers and Olympians that are just you know SOL. They have nowhere to train. So you know dry lands and calisthenics are really the only way to kind of you know, keep yourself in it if you're not having access to a pool. 
but everyone has to deal with it, so it's nothing to stress over. You know, this isn't something that's just folk, you know, isolated by the U.S. You know, every country has to deal with, you know, you know this setback. Let's see. All right, now, are you ever going to swim another 500 free again? Uh, that's to be, de to be determined. You know, it's a short course event, so it's mostly focused on high school and college swimmers. But, you know, I'd love to do it one more time. I never thought the race was that bad. I I think short course is a little bit easier as far as um, distance events go. Um, but that's totally individualized. Um, I'd like to try one more time. All right. Any other questions here that you can see? Let's see. What do I eat before I swim? That's a good one. That's one something I get at every clinic I go to. Um, I keep my workouts consistent generally. So if I'm eating, if you're eating garbage food the week before a meet, don't change up your diet the day or two before um, to think that you can make a big difference. You'll end up hurting yourself more than you'll help. Um, I generally eat, you know, high carbs, high fats, low sugar, um, high protein. So I'll do protein shakes if I can't keep any food down. But um, I'll try to eat as big meals as I can and, and um, just try to hold it. Good. Listen, um, I appreciate your time today. Thanks for coming on here and thanks for putting the presentation together for us. Um, we'll have uh, a replay of this available on fitterandfaster.com so you guys can come back and watch it and take notes as well. And uh, Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks a lot, bud. And hopefully we can get uh, some clinics going again soon and get on the road again. Yeah, sounds like a plan. All right, listen, uh, everybody take care. Thank you for being here with us today. Hopefully you learned something about the 500. I sure did, and we'll see you again soon. Take care.